This episode is about the Syrian regime's allies and is divided into six sections. First, an introduction, followed by a closer look at Iran, then Hezbollah, Russia, China, and North Korea. The Syrian war has had approximately 250,000 civilian deaths, 200,000 of which killed by the Assad regime many of which from chemical gases. Despite this, Syrian allies continue to support Bashar al-Assad's regime, mostly because of the non-intervention or the sovereignty principle. The violence that begun in 2011 has claimed an estimated total of 400 to 500,000 lives, with more than 5 million Syrian refugees. And as of April 2016, the estimated impact of the war was 400% of Syria's 2010 gross domestic product and their economy has constricted by more than 50%. Like other countries in the Middle East and North Africa, during the Arab uprisings, the conflict in Syria began with a protest at a mosque in the city of Dara, March 18th, 2011. The demonstrators were protesting the arrest and mistreatment of 15 local children after they painted revolutionary slogans on a wall. Government forces fired on the protesters, leaving hundreds dead, wounded and imprisoned. Although the protest began with the arrest of the Dara children, the conflict has been attributed to a wide variety of issues including climate change, which fueled migration from rural areas to urban areas, government repression, and the economic troubles. At the regional level, the Middle East experiences a geopolitical rivalry between the US and Russia and a geostrategic economic rivalry between the US and China. At the global level, there is great power politics with classical realist aspect taking place between the US, China and Russia. This global struggle between great powers has the quality of transforming the structure and the principles of the new emerging international system beyond simply changing the geopolitics of the Middle East. In this sense, a proxy war is taking place between Iran and Turkey and between Iran and Saudi Arabia. There is a bloc where Russia and China support Iran and a bloc of Saudi Arabia and Qatar supported by the US. At the same time, the Syria crisis also includes the sectarian clash dynamics in the regional Sunni-Shia axis. Henceforth, the Syria crisis has become the area of redesigning the Middle Eastern geopolitics. Syria needs help to rebuild. Many of the donors with the most money are also the least sympathetic to the regime. 70 countries and institutions met recently in Brussels to discuss how to help rebuild Syria without helping Bashar al-Assad at the same time. In response, Assad has pointed out that Syria has good relations with countries like China and Russia, while his ambassador to Beijing, Imad Mustafa, has said that because China, Russia and Iran have provided substantial support Syria during the military conflict, they should play a major role in the reconstruction of Syria. But it won't be an easy affair as the three compete for business. Already tensions have emerged between Iran and Russia this year, but both are unlikely to be able to offer the sums that China can. In addition to the 2 billion US dollars Beijing has already pledged to invest in Syria, Beijing used the 2020 China Arab States Corporation Forum to announce a further 23 billion US dollars in loans and aid for the Arab region. 
Iran supports the Assad regime and has been Syria's main backer in the region since well before the current conflict. During the entire Syrian civil war, Iran has been a major support and a strategic ally to Syria. It has helped financially by giving approximately 9 billion US dollars to Syria. Iran has also provided technical help and considerable amount of combat troops. In 2011, Iran's supreme leader Ali Khamenei vocally favored the Syrian government. As the uprising in Syria morphed into a civil war, Iran helped more with the military support. Iran has few allies in the Arab world and its most important one is Syria. The relationship dates back to the years after the 1979 Islamic Revolution in Iran. They needed to come together to fight their common rival, Saddam Hussein of Iraq. They also allied in order to check Israel advances into Lebanon and to prevent any American attempts to enter the Middle East. Each provided support to the Lebanese armed movement Hezbollah and to the Palestinian armed groups Hamas and Islamic Jihad. Syria has consistently provided Iran with an element of strategic depth. It gives Iran access to the Mediterranean and a supply line to Iran's Shia Muslim supporters in southern Lebanon next to the border with Israel. Losing their support would be a blow to Iran. Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah's words is that they view any threat to the Assad regime as a threat not only to Syria, but also the Palestinian and Lebanon. Whatever hope that existed for an Iraqi-Syrian reconciliation was destroyed by the culmination of the Iranian revolution in February 1979 and subsequent Iraqi invasion of Iran back in September 1980. With the arrival of Tehran of the Ayatollah Khomeini, who was an avowed implicable foe of Israel and the United States, Assad's father, Hafiz al-Assad, saw a definite union of interests, taking steps even before the 1980 Iran and Iraq war to develop a relationship that remains intact to this day. When Saddam Hussein invaded Iran in 1980, it made it that much easier for Damascus to openly side with the Islamic Republic. Because of its support of non-Arab Iran against Arab Iraq in the Iran-Iraq war, Syria's position in the Arab world became more isolated in the 1980s. The Gulf Arab states on whom Syria depended for financial and political support were consumed with matters concerning the Gulf and less so the Arab and Israeli arena. While maintaining the link with Iran, important because of its relationship with the Shiite groups in Lebanon and remaining a credible military threat to Israel, Syria made a strategic choice to join the Arab and Israeli peace process. To the rest of the world, the outward manifestation of this policy shift was Syria's participation in the US-led coalition to expel Iraq from Kuwait in the 1990-91 Gulf crisis. By late summer and fall of 2011, when many countries, including the United States, demanded that Bashar al-Assad step down as president. The conflict had become a proxy war. On the one side, in support of the Syrian government, were Russia, Iran, Hezbollah, and increasingly Iraq, the main players arrayed against the Syrian regime, seemingly in support of various Syrian opposition groups, were the United States and its European allies. Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and Qatar. President Obama 
had previously said the use of chemical weapons by the Assad regime would be a red line that if crossed would elicit a bold military response by the West. That did not happen, possibly because at the same time the Obama administration was secretly in meetings with Iranian officials that would eventually result in Obama's signature foreign policy success the deal with Iran to reduce its nuclear footprint. Any military action taken directly against the Syrian government could have derailed the delicate negotiations with Iran. In addition, Obama concluded that Syria was simply much more important to Russia and Iran than the United States. Therefore, Bashar's allies would always be willing to do more to help his regime than Washington and its allies would be willing to help the opposition. The Assad regime was receiving direct military support from Iran, Hezbollah and Shiite militias from Iraq and as far afield as Afghanistan. Israel shot down an Iranian drone and then carried out a significant attack against Syrian and Iranian bases from which the drone originated. Russia itself, by summer 2018, was mediating between the Iranians and the Israelis in an attempt to separate forces and prevent military mishaps. Russia and Iran, the two main military allies and enablers of the Syrian regime, are engaged in competition over access to the Syrian economy with a particular focus on opportunities to obtain reconstruction contracts. In addition to lines of credit and the supply of vital strategic products, Russia and Iran are pursuing a large role in the Syrian economy by agreeing investment contracts for their major companies and conglomerates. Moscow and Tehran seek partial compensation for their military interventions in Syria and both adopt an opportunity-based approach to the Syrian market. Russia demands unconditional international support for the reconstruction of Syria to stabilize the security of the country and to allow the return of refugees. Moscow also perceives reconstruction as an opportunity to facilitate the international and regional rehabilitation of Bashar al-Assad Russia and Iran have built up alliances with local businessmen in Syria and each country has established a business council to support and boost these relationships. The key sectors targeted by Russian and Iranian companies include oil and gas, electricity, agriculture, tourism and real estate. Assad constantly seeks to enlarge his own margin for maneuver by manipulating the interests of his allies. In addition to his ongoing efforts to re-establish his authority, Assad also perceptively manages Syria's economic interests on a case-by-case basis to maximize revenues. Regional Shia power Iran is believed to be spending billions of dollars a year to prop up President Assad and his Alawite-dominated government, providing military advisors and subsidized weapons, as well as lines of credit and oil transfers. Mr. Assad is Iran's closest Arab ally and Syria is the main transit point for Iranian weapons shipments to Lebanese Shia Islamist movement. Hezbollah. Iran is also believed to have been influential in Hezbollah's decision to send fighters to western Syria to assist pro-Assad forces. Militiamen from Iran and Iraq who say they are protecting Shia holy sites are also fighting alongside Syrian troops. In addition, the Hezbollah-Israeli war in the summer of 2006, which was highly destructive and engulfed half of Lebanon ended in a stalemate which, seen in relative terms, was considered something of a victory for Hezbollah. Its leader Hassan Nasrallah instantly became wildly popular throughout the Arab world 
even among Sunni Muslims. Since Syria was a staunch supporter of Hezbollah and saw itself as a head of what it considered to be an axis of resistance to the American-Israeli project in the region, Bashar's position in Damascus and in the region was strengthened by association. In addition to great power involvement, regional rivals Iran, funding the Lebanese Hezbollah among others, and Saudi Arabia, who were funding anti-regime militias, as well as Turkey, concerned about the rising power of Kurdish groups in northern Syria, and Israel, who were worried about the rising Iranian influence and the future of Syrian government, are enmeshed in the Syrian conflict. Russia, as well as China, promoted against a globalized liberal order under US hegemony, a multipolar world in which respect for state sovereignty and the authority of the UN Security Council were keys to constraining Western interventionism. Following what they saw as Western abuse of a UN Security Council humanitarian resolution to effect regime change in Libya, they began to assert the norm of sovereignty to constrain US activism in Syria, notably in the Security Council. Syria's Ba'athist regime was a historical ally, hence was seen to be in Russia's sphere of influence, and Moscow had interests that could be damaged if the regime fell, including naval facilities and arms and oil deals. Russia and Syria have been allies since 1956. Russia has been a very important international supporter of Syrian president and commander-in-chief of Syrian armed forces, Bashar al-Assad. During the Syrian civil war, Russia has been actively helping Syria in all ways it can. It has been sending military and technical help to Syria by sending warplanes, attack helicopters, artillery pieces and a good number of military advisors. It has also allegedly been helping the Syrian economy by sending a lot of banknotes by air to Syria. Despite a lot of criticism and backlash, Russia has proved time and again to be a great ally to Syria. Russia has had a naval presence in Tartus in Syria since 1971, which is a central aspect of Russian-Syrian relations, which serves as Russia's rural Mediterranean base for its Black Sea fleet and has forces at an air base in Latakia, President Assad's Shia Alawite heartland. The value of Russian arms sales to Syria is approximately 162 million United States dollars per year in both 2009 and 2010. Moscow also signed a 550 million US dollar deal with Syria for combat training jets. Russia's key policy goal is blocking American efforts to shape the region. Russia doesn't believe revolutions, wars and regime change bring stability and democracy. It often points to the Arab Spring and the US-led war in Iraq as evidence. Russia believes humanitarian concerns are often used as an excuse for pursuing America's own political and economic interests. Russia's backing of President Bar al-Assad is not only driven by the need to preserve its naval presence in the Mediterranean, secure its energy contracts or counter the West on regime change. It also stems from Putin's existential fear for his own survival and the survival of repressive systems that he and Bashar al-Assad represent. Russia has said it opposes any UN Security Council resolution that would permit military strikes against the Syrian regime. It has said there is no evidence the Syrian regime was responsible for the chemical attack on civilians. In April 2018, Russia used its veto power for the 12th time at the UN Security Council to block action directed at its Syrian ally. 
Russia has used its veto four times to block draft resolutions seeking to establish investigations of chemical weapons use in Syria's civil war. Britain, China, France, Russia and the United States are permanent Security Council members with veto powers. The other 10 members are selected for two-year terms on a rotating basis. The UN resolutions would require a nine positive vetoes and no veto to be adopted. In October 2016, the Russian ambassador to the UK argued that Russia intervened in Syria to fight terrorists and extremists and create the conditions for peace. Moscow believes Western military intervention would only infringe on Syrian sovereignty, but it would also create instability across the region. Kremlin's greatest fear is instability in the Middle East and Central Asia. Russia has acquiring pipelines and exploration rights in Turkey, Iraq, Lebanon and Syria. Russia is building a land bridge to Europe through the Middle East. In doing so, it will strengthen its role as Europe's primary gas supplier and expand its influence in the Middle East, potentially posing serious risk to the US and European interests. Russia won the exclusive right to produce Syria's oil and gas in January of 2017. On paper, that doesn't amount to much. Syria's proven oil reserves stand at 2.5 billion barrels, which is roughly 0.2% of the global share. And its proven natural gas reserves are insufficient to meet even domestic consumption. But Syria's main value to Moscow, like Turkey, lies in its location as a transport hub for exports. Assad has already stated that reconstruction will likely cost between 200 billion US dollars to 500 billion US dollars, with first priority in all contracts going to Moscow. With the Trump administration deciding to leave Syria as Russia remains firmly ensconced there, any energy infrastructure projects that transit through Syria will need Moscow's approval. Russia is already poised to reap major rewards as the United States abandoned Syria's largest oil fields with its withdrawal. Moscow's involvement in Lebanon has a Syrian angle as well. Russia has deepened commercial ties with Lebanon as part of its efforts to roll back US influence in the region, with trade between Russia and Lebanon nearly doubling from 423 million United States dollars in 2016 to 800 million US dollars in 2018. Lebanon's offshore oil and gas sector has also favored Russian companies. The Russian firm Novatech won a 20% stake in two offshore exploration blocks. Russia's primary interest in Lebanon is as a conduit to Syria. In January, Rosneft signed a 20-year agreement for managing and upgrading an oil storage facility in Tripoli, Lebanon, which lies just 18 miles from the Syrian border and is 37 miles from the Russian-controlled Syrian port of Tartus, Moscow's only foothold on the Mediterranean Sea. The deal's value has been kept secret but the facility's proximity to Syria would allow Moscow to use it for covert fuel deliveries to the Assad regime, an activity the US Treasury sanctions have sought to thwart. Syria's reconstruction remains several years away, and the country's value as an energy hub will be worthless as long as it's under crippling US sanctions. Turkey and Iraq hold the most immediate promise for Moscow's energy ambitions, while Russian involvement in Lebanon and Syria demonstrates that Moscow is digging in for the long game as an Assad ally in order to secure and expand its energy monopoly over Europe. On September the 30th in 2015, Russia began a sustained air campaign against Syrian opposition positions from an airbase 
it built outside of Latakia. In essence, Russia became the Syrian Air Force. As a result, Syrian and pro-government forces were able to go on the offensive and retake some territory, including Palmyra in March of 2016 and Aleppo by the end of the year. Combined with the shrinking territory held by ISIS, including the fall of Raqqa in 2017, to the US-supported Syrian Democratic Front, composed mostly of Syrian Kurds, the military successes by Russian and Iranian-supported regime forces well into 2018 made it seem that the only side that produced something approximating victory was the Syrian government. With the military intervention, Putin made an emphatic statement, basically saying to those countries which had been supporting various Syrian opposition groups that Russia was not going to let the Syrian regime of Bashar al-Assad collapse. Moscow preserved its strategic interests in Syria and also secured a central role for itself in any sort of negotiated settlement to the conflict. If successful, Putin would stand tall, rehabilitate Russia's image following its military adventure in the Ukraine and even possibly a grateful Europe, itself feeling the weight of thousands of Syrian refugees flooding into the continent. And following this, hopefully an end to the international economic sanctions imposed on Moscow. The Russian military interventions has reactivated a dispersed process of diplomacy, with the UN sponsoring one track in Geneva, Russia, Iran and Turkey sponsoring the Kazakhstan process, and a Russian-hosted track convening Syrian government and Syrian opposition groups.